Thank you very much, John. I, I always enjoy watching John speak, and, and I don't say that just because he's more senior than me within FIRE. I, I really do enjoy his talks. I think one of the things that he, he, uh, he articulate, articulates very eloquently is that security, uh, we sometimes we get so caught up in technology, we, we, we're all technical people, we love technology, we forget that what we're really trying to do is mitigate risk, try and help reduce the risk surface area within our organizations. And of course, to do that, we need to understand what that risk is based upon the threats that are coming at us on a daily basis. And when we better understand those threats, we can better, of course, manage the risk and understand the risk that they present to us, which I think John uh, went through a methodology as to how to, uh, stand to, how to better understand that um, in, in, a, in a quantifiable way within an organization, which is, I think, something that all, all too often gets overlooked in the security space. Uh, so, so please uh, join me in thanking John for his, uh, for his good words. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Dr. Kenneth Gears, Cyber Center Ambassador at NATO. Kenneth Gears is a NATO Cyber Center Ambassador and Atlantic Council Senior Fellow and a visiting professor at Taras Shevchenko National University in Kiev. I apologize to any of the Ukrainian or Russian speakers. <laughs> Dr. Gear spent 20 years in the U.S. government, Army, NSA, NCIS, and NATO, and was a senior global threat analyst at FireEye. He is the author of Strategic Cybersecurity, editor of Cyber War and Perspective, Russian Aggression Against Ukraine, editor of The Virtual Battlefield, Perspectives on Cyber Warfare, technical expert for the Tallinn Manual on the International Law Applicable to Cyber Warfare, and author of more than 20 articles and chapters on international conflict in cyberspace. That is certainly an impressive resume. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gears to the stage. Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, I'm not a technical guy. As the the uh, um, previous speaker uh, said, we're all technical guys. Actually, I'm, uh, I have a background in international relations, um, and I started my career in government some time ago as just a linguist, but as an intelligence analyst. And in the mid-90s, uh, in the middle of Maryland, I was an uh, analyst, and there was a uh, pressure for uh, a geopolitical analyst to know more about uh, C2C or computer to computer communications as well as uh, uh, human uh, activities. Uh, so I transitioned and by the end of the 90s I was working on uh, as an intelligence analyst but on cyber things uh, and computer affairs. Uh, so I, I worked at NCIS like the TV show in NATO in, uh, in the uh, Estonia um, during 2007, uh, during the uh, cyber attack on Estonia, basically the Pentagon asked me to move there to help build the, the cyber center, and it now has uh, 20 uh, nations. Uh, now I live in Ukraine, and uh, so I seem, there seems to be a trend here. I'm sort of following uh, cyber attacks. Uh, last year, I, for NATO, I, I edited a volume uh, with 20 authors uh, looking at the cyber dimension of the conflict uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and what we found basically was uh, every stone you, you turn over, uh, there were attacks and operations. None of them decisive, none of them die hard for. Uh, but yet, if you are in charge of an organization, uh, no matter what that is, it seems like today, cybersecurity is going to be an element that you're going to have to worry about. Uh, for example, in Ukraine, in politics, the election was thoroughly hacked. Uh, for diplomats, their communications were stolen and then uploaded to YouTube and announced on Twitter. Uh, in the social media space, uh, there is accounts that pop up and then criticize governments and disappear. And when you search on that person, they don't really exist. Um, in uh, 
the military space, there were special forces operations in eastern Ukraine to isolate Crimea and uh, eastern Ukraine from, from Kiev. And so basically, in every, geo, in every economic sector, for example, in the business sector, smart TVs were hacked with Russian propaganda. But you saw examples of, of cyber attacks. And so one of the takeaways, you don't take anything else away, is just to use common sense uh, and logic current events, geopolitical background, when you think about you know, what you're seeing, because I spent hours and hours in the basement of the, the Pentagon basically looking at long lists of IP addresses uh, to which data was flowing from the Pentagon for years, um, but then from a law enforcement counterintelligence perspective, you know, all, all you really know is you're losing data and it's going to what's called the, the, the first hop. The problem of the first hop is that you know you you have an IP address and that's it really. You have to you have to dig deeper in terms of traditional uh, investigative uh, powers uh, and, and and abilities. For example, in 2007, when Estonia was under cyber attack, the uh, the vast majority of the packets were coming from the United States. It certainly wasn't the United States government that was uh, attacking Estonia. Then when those uh, packets began to be filtered, the, uh, the attacks came from Egypt. Then they came from Vietnam, right? So it, it's a global architecture. Let me show you a little bit. Uh, here's a, a paper I presented on uh, for when I was an analyst at FireEye, looking at 30 million malware communications over an 18-month period. Uh, and these are just where the... Uh, where the malware servers were, were located, right? So here you can see the US uh, as well as every other country. Um, it's, it's a global space that's all tied together uh, and where uh, malware communications uh, between nations uh, are really, it's, it's an international space that is bigger than any jurisdiction, that is bigger than any sovereignty on the planet. This is the challenge that, that Russia and Iran and North Korea have now that leads them to, uh, to fear the internet uh, while they're trying to use it uh, for political and social control. If you pull this, uh, this diagram out, uh, stretch it uh, to a large degree into a circle. Uh, another disturbing factor you'll see is that pretty much there are malware connections between any two countries on the planet. Now, what does this mean? If you're, if you're a hacker, you're an intelligence operative, you can route your communications a different way every time. So when I put, did this report, I discovered all kinds of new digraphs, uh, for example, .ax is a small sovereign piece, island between um, Finland and Sweden, I didn't even know existed, called Åland, right? Well, unsurprisingly, Åland has its share of malware servers, like every other city, state, uh, enterprise, and of course country uh, on the planet. But from a law enforcement and a counterintelligence perspective, you can imagine this creates enormous headaches. Um, and how are you going to, as, as an investigator, follow this trail back? At the very least, as, as a, uh, you, to me, it seems like you have to be a nation uh, because anything short of that, a true attribution is hardly possible because you need to pull together signals intelligence and diplomacy, uh, law enforcement, um, and all kinds of uh, larger toolbox uh, tools and tactics in order to get there. Otherwise, you're left with this problem of the first hop. Here's a traditional map where the, showing you where the malware servers are located. And, and here, I want to suggest uh, something else. Uh, unfortunately, mo many, many malware servers are located in places where there's a lot of infrastructure, such as the United States. Um, however, of course, in a sense, this also gives the United States an advantage uh, from the standpoint of oversight and monitoring, right? You want to have more data to look at. The more data, uh, the better, really. Uh, so in this sense, I, I, I would even suggest that, that the United States has a certain strategic depth in cyberspace uh, that Napoleon and Hitler found Russia possessed in traditional uh, geopolitical space uh, when they invaded Russia, right, and discovered that it gets very cold there in winter. 
Uh, in the same way, the United States uh, has lots of vulnerabilities and lots of targets, uh, but at the same time, it would be very hard uh, to wipe the United States off uh, the internet uh, due to its uh, um, overwhelming size. Uh, whereas a country like North Korea, and I would suspect even countries like Russia and Iran have to worry about, uh, because the more authoritarian you are, perhaps the fewer internet connections you'll have. You may not know this, but Antarctica has more internet connections than about a third of the United Nations members. Uh, and those are for research purposes, but it also gives you uh, an idea of just how uh, some countries fear uh, internet connectivity. So there are plenty of even recent cyber attacks uh, which let you know that the, uh, it's a problem not only for every institution, um, but the line between network security and national security is uh, hardly there anymore. Uh, because you can see that the OPM hack, for instance, in the United States, um, Bruce Schneier said maybe it was a cyber Pearl Harbor. And why would he say that? I think it's because the intelligence hall from this attack is uh, so large, it's hard to get your mind around. For example, all people that work in the United States government, their polygraphs, uh, as well as all of the uh, things they've told investigators, their financial status, et cetera, all of it was taken, right, by a foreign government. Uh, this puts them all in jeopardy, basically, of being manipulated and targeted very specifically. Now, to, over time, targeting has become very specific. Uh, it used to be a computer would be in a, in a room and you'd have to break into that room, but now we all have supercomputers in our, in our pockets, uh, which is kind of cool, but at the same time, that would allow, for instance, in Maidan in, in Ukraine, was the, the, uh, the uh, the protesters who were moving around the city, uh, the government was actually able to target them depending on what street they were on or if they were close to the presidential palace. Uh, so you can, you can do it in numerous ways, but it does, the fact that you're closely connected to the internet at an intimate personal level, for instance, through social media, a uh, trusted circle that you have self-selected out of the whole world, uh, means that intelligence agencies, information operations folks, propagandists, politicians, Donald Trump, can target you personally, right? Uh, and so that, that is a, uh, a very d disturbing factor. I saw actually a, uh, a cartoon yesterday on the internet, and as a guy is walking through a shopping center, uh, basically he sees all these very embarrassing advertisements that are targeting him for personally, right? Because that's actually possible to do on the things he likes to eat and things he needs. Uh, but in fact, uh, that's how tailored uh, things, including uh, information operations, can be. So when you, when you look at also economic attacks, you know, this, this also, um, this could easily be um, a military intelligence operation, right, to move money when even money has been digitized and you can move it around the world at, at light speed. Well, uh, especially, everybody's short on budgets, right? Um, and the fact is, is in cyberspace today, there's very little in, in the, for fear of retaliation and prosecution. And so it's very possible that even militaries might resort to this kind of, uh, kind of activity. And then, and then finally, we see on the right, this is the, in Western Ukraine, there was an attack on, on a power grid uh, that everybody was waiting for uh, to see when it would happen. Um, we know that the connectivity is there and the vulnerability is there to manipulate critical infrastructure. Uh, but intelligence agencies and militaries, they're doing a lot of experimentation and signaling now in cyberspace because they're trying to figure out where are the red lines uh, in terms of what you can and can't do. And I would suggest that, that a little bit more of the activity than we realize, malicious activity in cyberspace today, is by militaries. And why is that? It's because if you are in charge of making sure the next Pearl Harbor doesn't happen, or you're in charge of, of making sure that, that uh, you can win a war against your, your adversary, there has to be a lot of hacking that goes on in peacetime in order to be ready for war. A big difference between a traditional military operation and a cyber operation is that you can choose to do a traditional military operation today. You know, so you could send soldiers across the border, or a spy, uh, or a tank, or a plane. But hacking, it takes a long time. It takes months. 
maybe years of painstaking subversion to get into Microsoft, into Google, or into the, the power grid that, that uh, guards Paris or Washington or Moscow. Uh, so what this means, unfortunately, for military organizations is that they look much more like a covert arm of the government. Uh, so packets don't wear uniforms. Right? Uh, this, this particular unit of the military is going to be tasked with doing things that, are, that look a lot more like a covert operation in peacetime. So I'm also on this uh, Cyber Command academic team, and, and I know a lot of technical personnel hate the uh, phrase Cyber Pearl Harbor, uh, but in fact we spend a lot of time there talking about Cyber Pearl Harbor. Um, and and the, the challenge, again, is that, that because computers and processors uh, and hard drives um, sit on planes, uh, tanks, uh, ships, uh, if you haven't seen, I mean, they're not going to build ships and, uh, or planes anyway in the future, and a lot of the new Navy ships, too, don't have people on them, right? They are, uh, they are floating or flying computers. Um, so what that means is, is that uh, Terminator scenarios are, are much closer than we think. You're going to have to give some of these attack vehicles uh, code that gives them autonomy so that they know whom to kill and when, because they might be too far away for traditional uh, hands-on control, right? But the encryption, uh, the source code uh, that sits on these machines uh, is always vulnerable to some kind of attack. There's only three kind of basic sorts of cyber attack. There is stealing information, there's blocking information, and there's changing information. Uh, but all of these things will be done in a military context, uh, but because of the nature of hacking and the time and the energy it takes to do, you've got to get started now. So if you haven't seen Ghost in the Shell on the right, there's going to be a, this is from all the way from 1995, and I think the manga was actually even from the 80s, uh, but next year there'll be a Scarlett Johansson film coming out uh, in which she'll try to play a Japanese uh, major. So the players in cyberspace, this also is, is an area of, of uh, concern because there's so much plausible deniability in cyberspace, there's so much anonymity uh, that who's attacking you uh, is a challenge. Uh, you could always you know, pass it off to uh, outsourced uh, contractors or route it through countries with which um, your target has poor law enforcement uh, or diplomatic uh, relations. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to, to, to trace it back. But also when the, you know, the hacking team, for example, has so much uh, hacker expertise within it, then it gives them uh, the ability to do things that you might think that only governments are, are in fact uh, capable of. So here's the last uh, um, graphic I'll leave you with, uh, and it's from Reporters Without Borders. And basically what I want to suggest here is that, that we're not on a level playing field around the world. There are some very open and transparent countries and there's some very uh, authoritarian and very short-sighted uh, countries all within cyberspace. So for example, when Putin talks about national security, I really think Putin is talking about regime security. Uh, and think about it, there is a very big difference. And so when the cyber negotiate, negotiations are taking place between East and West, sometimes one group is talking about cyber security and the other is talking about information security. Uh, those are two different things because then a blog that is critical of the president would be seen as a cyber attack. Thank you. <laughs>